All right, good afternoon. My name is Alexa Siebold. I'm an occupational therapist from Positive Steps Therapy. And I'm joined this afternoon um, by some colleagues from Caring Hands Pediatrics, um, Dr. Lisa Wong. This is our third Facebook Live together. It feels pretty normal at this point. Um, and pretty comfortable. We're, we're used to it now. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then we have a new doctor with us today, Dr. Melanie Austin. Hi. This yeah, is my first doctor. time. <laughs> We're really happy to have Dr. Austin with us. She's been an, a great addition to our practice and she's been with us for a few months now, so. Awesome. Yep. So today we're gonna talk about milestones, which is a hot topic right now um, for a couple different reasons. So quick overview of kind of, we can go back and forth about what you guys are seeing on your end, how you're determining someone is either delayed or ahead of those milestones, what some of those differences look like from the CDC recently, and then how on the therapy side of it, we also can manage and how we track our milestones to determine the best plan of care. So um, uh, Dr. Austin, do you mind kind of going over a little bit of what the CDC has kind of, how it's changed and what that looks like on your end as a pediatrician? Sure, these changes are brand new. So um, we're all learning what these changes are along uh, with you and the patients. Um, the, um, the checklists that we have been using for years um, uh, usually looked at about 50% of babies or toddlers or children at this age should be able to do this, um, whether it be uh, Gabbling, cooing, um, pulling to a stand, walking. Um, now the checklist looks more like 75% or the, the majority of children at a given age and stage should be able to do this, um, uh, which liberalizes things quite a bit. Um, so I, I, some things we're going to see how this works. Yeah. Um, be a learning curve for everyone for sure absolutely absolutely and then I did see that they added two different milestones in there now um, that 15 month and that 30 month checkpoint um, right. so what does that kind of turn into on the clinical side of things are are they expected to come in now on that 15 month and 30 month visit we would like to see them then um, one of the things um, that we can do at 15 and 30 months is to catch people up on vaccines, but that's mm -hmm. not the most important thing for a 15 and 30 month visit. The mm -hmm. most important thing is that we're making sure that they're developmentally on track. Mm -hmm. um, and that, um, and that kind of gets missed, you yeah. know, with COVID people didn't want to come in and yeah. I completely understand that. Where are all the sick people? They're at the doctor. Yeah. Um, I get it. Um, but uh, we're missing chances to intervene early. Yeah. So um, as, uh, as our levels are dropping here in Allegheny County, um, I'd love to be able to see more people coming in, catching up and, and see them at their 15 and 30 month visits. I love that 30 month visit too, because um, that two to three year seems like a long year. So 30 month now, it's kind of a nice little check-in point, like you said, to maybe catch something that flew under the radar at their two-year-old visit. The other thing with that 30 month is that in the past, a lot of the insurance companies wouldn't pay for a 30 month visit. And I think they really recognized that between two and three years of age is a long time. Mm -hmm. And so that way we can catch some of those developmental delays at the 30 month visit. The 15 month visit, we've always done that as a well child care visit, but the 30 month one is, is relatively insurance companies would pay for that. Okay. Um, Dr. Austin touched a little bit on how those well visits have changed since COVID. Um, Dr. Wong, how have you um, kind of what what is being skewed now? What are some of those trends that you guys are seeing with those well visits? Yeah, Dr. Austin had mentioned how people haven't been coming in. So there are a lot of patients that are behind on their well visits. And for a variety of reasons with the pandemic, some people are afraid to come in because they don't want to get anything. So they're kind of isolated in their home. 
And then we did have to cancel some patients because they were exposed to COVID. So we didn't want to bring that in. So there are a lot of patients that have gotten behind. Um, now with the numbers coming down, hopefully we can get everybody caught up. Mm -hmm. uh, we are noticing more patients that are failing the developmental screens. So mm -hmm. when they come into their well visits, we always have them fill out a, a developmental questionnaire. And it does seem like there have been more people that have been failing that. And I don't know if some of that is related to not being in daycare or preschool, people are not socializing as much, and there's a lot that kids learn from other kids. Mm -hmm. So I think some of it may be related to that, um, the social isolation. And then parents are also doing work from home, so they might not be doing as many of those, uh, working on as many of those skills at home. Mm -hmm. Dr. Austin, have you been finding that same thing? or I've been you seeing that pretty much also. Um, that the um, kids are lacking often in communication and in social development. Um, I, again, I, almost everybody I see and since I started working in the clinic is not in daycare. And I totally understand that. And, and it, my kids are older now. And if I had littles that couldn't be vaccinated, they wouldn't be in daycare either. Um, but there are some things that we need to uh, keep an eye on and uh, help with. And those that are in daycare, um, they um, often everybody is masked, mm -hmm. um, and that that can uh, that can impede uh, some communication. Mm -hmm. um, now, not a reason not to mask, <laughs> but that means we just have to work a little harder. Yeah. Yeah. It's getting people to think, I think to parents, daycare, for instance, was just, it's what everyone did or preschool. It's just what everyone did. And now that there's a choice, it's about educating that even though you're making that choice indirectly, this is kind of what daycare and preschool did beforehand. So that's maybe why we're seeing some of those delays coming through is because they were doing something that just felt like second nature by sending their child to daycare or preschool. And now that that's a missing link, just trying to connect that, you know, you don't want to make anyone feel bad about it, but just kind of highlighting some of these um, areas of development were there naturally, and now they're not. And I think there's a lot of things that parents can do at home. I think when you recognize that, and if we do those screens at the well visit, then we know, okay, these are some things that we should work on. And we oftentimes will give parents handouts at home to work on X, Y, and Z. And uh, those checklists, the CDC handouts also have a lot of things that patients, parents can work on with their kids at home, kind mm -hmm. of before reaching the point of getting to therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how are you guys making those referrals? Is there a certain point where you say, okay, this is kind of the direction that you need to head now. Do you kind of say, we'll see you in three months from now and see where this is going? Um, talk me through that process a little bit before they even get to therapy. I feel like we, it, it's very case by case. And there are some parents who really wanna get into therapy early. There are other parents who, well, I wanna work on this at home. So I think it depends. As I said, we do do those surveys when they come in for their well visits. And let's say it comes back borderline. I might just say, okay, here's some things that you can work on at home. Let's recheck you either at the next well visit and see where things are. And if we're still borderline or failing, then I'm gonna refer you to therapy. Um, and I think that it's a conversation that we have with the parents. It kind of depends on what they are comfortable with and what, what they're able to do at home. There are some people who mm -hmm. want to go in earlier and some people who want to go in later. So it's very individual. Definitely if they're failing those surveys, I usually do try to get them into therapy much earlier rather than waiting. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. it kind of depends on the, the individual. Yeah. And probably what milestone they're talking about too. Sure. That's true too. It depends on what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we're talking about a communication milestone, maybe, you know, it's 
we're going to be looking at their ears or sending them to have hearing testing mm -hmm. before first, just to make sure that there's no medical uh, problem underlying it. Um, and I think some people, they hear the words early intervention and um, they, it, it freaks them out a little. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm always very open that my own kid was in uh, Alliance uh, through uh, Allegheny County. And it was an amazing experience. Yeah. Um, they did tremendous work with her. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and I think yeah. I think like when we kind of get into some of these milestones too, once parents understand how they all kind of connect, it kind of opens those floodgates of you know what now we are. I also notice this, and I, it opens up that conversation, mm -hmm. which makes it so much more collaborative on our end too. Mm -hmm. Are you getting more referrals now, Alexa? Yeah, so we are. Um, I would definitely say since the pandemic, coupled with kids who are now home more often in front of their parents all day long, um, but also these well visits with their pediatricians, I think you guys are doing a great job at using that conversation um, and bringing up that there is a solution, you know, if they ha they're having these concerns that there's outpatient, there's EI um, where they can go. So we've definitely see an, seen an influx, especially that birth to two or three. Um, there are some of our families are getting both EI and outpatient because the parents now have a lot of flexibility as well. So they can bring them in for more visits um, and then they can be more hands-on at home too. So. It's, um, it's a great thing um, to see more parents coming for therapy, um, but it's also a very interesting trend to see kind of where we were maybe three years ago at this time with that same, same age group. Are you doing them in person and virtually? Some, for some people, it's convenient to do virtual. Some people don't like virtual visits. How is that going? We're primarily in the clinic. If a child is home because a sibling is sick or a family member is sick, then we can do a, a virtual visit. We find with that birth to three, it's a little bit more difficult to do virtual visits. It's nice every once in a while because we can get those parents to have some hands-on experience and really use that parent coaching model. But for the most part, uh, most of our kids are coming into the clinic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so milestones is like a huge mountain to tackle. I mean, you could read through every handout in the world and still never fully grasp it all. So I think today it would be nice to split them up into those big three that we talk about movement based milestones, feeding based milestones, and then some communication. Um, and have the conversation about the milestones that we look at on a therapy end and how those kind of connect to the milestones that you guys typically flag in the clinic as well. Um, so the first one will, will be movement. Um, we find that a lot of our kids come to the, the clinic for those gross motor. So they're not rolling, they're not standing, they're not walking. Um, and it's so fluid for us. In that first year, those milestones are changing every two months. So it's kind of easier to intervene because we have a clear direction of where they should be and where they should be going. Um, but really what we try to tell the parents is, you know, we just want some movement. So by four months, we're really tolerating that tummy time so that by six months, we're comfortable in that position. We're pushing up maybe getting ourselves into sitting. Nine months now we're sitting a little bit more unsupported in preparation for that scooting crawling. And then so by 12 to 15 months we're standing and walking. So kind of walking them through those, those basic milestones. They don't have to, you know, we don't say at this month exactly, this is where you need to be. But we say by this month, this is what should have come before that. Kind of helps paint that picture and alleviate some of that pressure on the parents too. Um, but I know that the CDC recently took out crawling. That's one of those big changes. And on a therapy side, that's like red flag, red flag. We love crawling for so many reasons. Um, but are you guys tied to crawling as kind of a milestone or do you follow just that general progression of tummy to sitting to standing to walking? Do you keep it pretty I'm not, I, I'm not wedded 
to <laughs> crawling okay. just because there's so many different ways mm -hmm. um, for a kid to move. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's an you know, army crawl and there's, you know, what we normally think, you know, using all four, like my kids, we, we let, we didn't have rugs because we had pets. So they never crawled on their knees. Mm -hmm. They only did like hands forward, scoot to the side, yeah. and they were fast doing yes. that. And um, so, you know, they're, so long as they're making the effort to move, that's what I want to see. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Dr. Wong, would you say the same? Yeah, I think some parents will get concerned about their child not crawling. So I don't worry so much if they're not crawling per se, but I look at how their movement is. There are some kids who, let's say they roll, they can roll over, you know, they're four, four to six months of age and they can get from this end of the room to the other end of the room rolling over. Well, I'm going to be less concerned that because they're able to be somewhat mobile. And there's some kids that end up doing army crawl or getting up on all fours. There's some kids that like Dr. Austin said, never really crawl and they go straight to walking. So I think it's, again, looking at the context of everything, not just saying, oh, my kid can't crawl. Mm -hmm. I think we look at, well, how, how is their tone? Are they able to push up? Are they able to sit up? And are they able to move around even if it is army crawl? So I think we evaluate all of those things as opposed to just saying, oh, they can't crawl or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that you touch on those underlying skills too, because we, I have some families that are like, I didn't crawl as a, as a child. And my husband didn't crawl as a child. We went right to walking and that's great. But like you're saying, it, are they not crawling because their arms are weak? Are they not crawling because their head and neck posture is uncoordinated? So we try to do a little bit of that education of we can, we can army crawl, we can scoot as long as we're bearing weight through our arms. And we know that they have some of that underlying coordination because it, they, it really ties into so much more down the, the road of that upper body and lower body disassociation. Um, so we're, you know, we're not sticklers per se of that they have to follow this sequence, but that they have those underlying skills that if we were to put them in that position, do they know what to do sort of thing? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I don't think it's just can they or can they not do that, but kind of in context with that. It's kind of similar to some of the kids that aren't rolling over, parents say, well, they're not rolling over yet, but is it that they can't do it or, well, they're just more comfortable laying on their back because they can see everything. So there's no necessity to roll over. And some of those kids are just laid back kids that, well, why should I flip over? Then I just see the floor. I, I can't see everything that's going on out here. Right. And so it, it, it depends, but then I might pick them up and let's take a look at their tone. Are they sliding through my fingers or are they, are they able to bear weight on their legs? So I think there's that piece of that, that we don't necessarily get from just doing a questionnaire mm -hmm. development. So it has to be taken into context of the exam and some other things that the child's doing. I love that you guys do a physical exam too, of putting them in those positions. Are there certain things that you look for to flag, maybe something like a torticollis um, or a kiddo who's already walking, maybe some of that toe walking? Is there any, you know, do you look for those kind of indicators? So sometimes you notice that just as the child is sitting on the parent's lap and you'll see the kid is sitting like this. So before we even ask any questions or do any exam, you can see it right off the bat. And then when we put them on the exam table, you can also see that. I, I always flip the kids over too, just to see how they are in their bellies. Cause then I can get a look at the shape of the head, how they're pulling up the head, are they picking up the head? Are they getting up on their arms? Are they pushing up on their arms? So there's a lot of that stuff that we can take a look at. Yeah. yeah. Or it's torticollis or. And I think um, picture number one that we have will show it's a, an example of what torticollis looks like. And on a therapy side, that's another reason why we really want to encourage different positions because this child, you know, in when he's laying, you may not be able to tell, but as soon as you sit him up, and you're, he's favoring one side just a little bit, maybe he only is rolling to that left side. Um, to the parent, he's moving, but 
they're not picking up on that pattern. He's only rolling onto one side. Um, so really getting them into those developmental positions um, and you know maybe some just education on stretching and then at their next visit, if nothing's improved, then we move on to therapy, something like that. But really getting them up and sitting and rolling just to see what is their head and neck doing um, and where, you know, are they favoring any sort of side? Mm -hmm. um, another one that is pretty prevalent on the therapy side is that toe walking. Um, and a general rule of thumb that we use is the PTs generally give six months after the child becomes ambulatory to kind of figure out any abnormalities on their own. Um, do you guys, do you both have a similar thing that you follow with toe walking? It's, it's usually something that the parent is more aware of that we find, um, or is that something that you're still kind of pointing out like, hey, did you notice or? On, on exam, I just like to make sure that their Achilles is not abnormally shortened. Mm -hmm. um, then they have full range of motion of their, their foot. Mm -hmm. um, and after that, let's, let's wait and see, let's see what they do. Is it, is it different in shoes? Is it different when they're barefoot mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and give it a little bit of time? Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah, I don't always wanna give an age per se, but it also depends on whether the child has cerebral palsy or there are other right. issues related to that child. Tone walking can be normal um, in the first few years of life. And again, I, like Dr. Austin said, I mean, I examine them to see if we can stretch that out. Does it seem like they're really tight there? If they're really tight there, then I'm gonna refer them sooner for treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I like that you brought it up that it is normal because especially with some of those younger kiddos to move faster, they go up on their toes, they move faster on yeah. their toes. And so then parents are like, are they toe walking? And that's why we kind of give it a little bit of time for them to figure out how to, how to improve that cadence of my steps without going up on my toes. But that physical exam that you mentioned, Dr. Austin, is awesome too, to make sure that there's nothing musculoskeletal that they need to work through first. Um, another one that is is flagged pretty often here is W sitting. We'll have, um, I believe that's picture number three will pop up on the screen. A lot of kids, especially in play, will kind of W sit like this. And therapeutically that's indicative of some postural weakness, um, some hypermobility at the hips. And we know long-term that could turn into, um, you know, joint kind of stiffness and then that low uh, tone in, in the abdomen. So usually our W kids, they come in for something else and we notice and play their W sitting and we're just constantly moving those legs back into crisscross or long sitting. Um, and it's generally easier to fix the younger we catch it, but we still have some, you know, four or five-year-olds that they just prefer to, to sit in that spot and we really have to work them out of it. Um, any referrals off the top of your head that you can think of of W sitting? It's usually not something that parents pick up on on our end. I, I think that you probably would see it more just in therapy. For us, what happens is the parent will say the child is pigeon toed and so they're in. -toeing. And so then when you ask them about it, are they W sitting, then they'll say, oh, yeah, they do seem to sit like that all the time. And then we encourage them to sit more, you know, crisscross applesauce. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then we send them to you for therapy. Yeah. To that. And sometimes we'll see it in the beginning when they're, um, when they're going from the four extremity crawl mm -hmm. and then they, they kind of scoop back to sit and they come into that W position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just have the parents like reconfigure them, yeah. um, but not to freak out. It's not a, no. it's not yeah. a sign that something is, is amiss. Yeah. yeah, it's usually something we just tack on and, and move on from there. But um, again, it's good to kind of explain to the parents, we're not being picky. We don't need them to sit a certain way, but what that could lead to down the road. Um, all right. So moving on from movement, kind of um, how to get up to walking. Another big one that we always talk about milestones that parents come in is that eating, um, and feeding. Um, and so feeding is a little bit more, 
it seems like an emergency to parents when they come and see us on the therapy end because it, it's hard when your child's not eating. Um, so what we really look for from like that birth to six months is how are they latching and how are they feeding? Sometimes they'll come right from the hospital and we get referrals because they, you know, had to be seen by a specialist and they identified um, some sort of uh, delay or abnormality that's limiting their volume. Um, and one thing that we really touch on here is that tongue and that lip tie in this, we try to catch it from that birth to six months, um, which I believe we have a picture, it's number five. Um, and we try to catch that ahead of time because then by, there we go, there's that tongue tie there. So the tongue is not able to move as fluidly and as freely as it wants to in the mouth. And so that limits how much suction they have and how good of a, a latch that they have on that bottle. And then they often get frustrated with feeding. Um, so that birth to six, we kind of look for something like that so that by six to nine, they're interested. Now they're sitting up more. If you think back on those gross motor milestones, they're sitting a little bit better and now they're able to support their bottles a little bit better so that by nine to 12, we're now self-feeding and having a little bit more coordination. So kind of how that progression and movement, it's the same for feeding. We're on our backs to feed, then we're sitting and then we're unsupported sitting. So um, generally, if we get that lip and tongue tie corrected, then we're working on just more of the messy play, sensory play with some of our feeders. I know that's a big one as well, of just letting your kids get messy and figure out how to feed themselves with Cheerios and they miss 12 of them, but one gets in their mouth and just teaching some of that patience. But um, that's kind of the progression so that by 12 months, we say anything that you can squeeze between your fingers is fine to give your 12 month old. Um, to start kind of getting that chew sequence. So that's the general progression that we see. Again, it's so fluid that at least by, you know, six months, we're starting to get an emerging kind of jaw movement, um, teeth start coming in. So is the parent just presenting the opportunity to feed is, is really what, how we coach on that. Um, I'm sure volume of foods is something that's brought up maybe at well visits if the baby doesn't seem like they're eating enough. Um, but what about that lip and tongue tie? Is that something that you guys also are seeing or is being flagged by the parent? Usually we're, we're catching that in the hospital. We're, we're seeing that immediately because right. it's going to affect ability to latch uh, mm -hmm. in babies that are nursing. Mm -hmm. So, um, Parents know right away when the baby can't latch. Yeah. Um, and that's a big problem. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, figuring out how tight is the tongue? Is it really a tongue tie that's the issue or are we just seeing a normal tongue? Mm -hmm. um, so you wanna make sure that that tongue is extending past the lip. Um, I've seen very tied tongues, and but they can, they can uh, get their, um, their tongue past their lip. So great. They're, we don't need to do anything mm -hmm. unless you're having pain as far as nursing. Um, and then the, the lip tie, um, you know, if they can't splay the lips out to latch, that can be an issue. It's also an orthodontic issue mm -hmm. later on, but you know, that's, that we can pick up later. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like lip and tongue, tongue tie, really any of these special topics that we've been talking about could have conversations all on themselves. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But uh, there's the tongue tie seems to be more of an issue than the lip tie in that initial period. Uh, sometimes we'll refer them after their right at birth from the hospital. And like Dr. Austin said, they oftentimes have trouble latching on. That said, there's some kids that have a little bit of a tongue tie, but if they're latching fine and it's not causing a problem, they don't necessarily need to have that repaired or clipped. The lip tie, I've had some patients, like you said, that that lip just keeps getting sucked in instead of, you know, the lips should be flanged out. And if they're having trouble with the breastfeeding, then they might get referred to have that corrected. The bottle, 
A lot of times they'll have less problem with the bottle because you don't have to have such a deep latch with that. And so they might be doing fine with the bottle and you don't necessarily need to get that repaired. And so some of those kids will be fine. And then when they start the speech is when we notice problems again. And that's the other time that we might end up referring them because they're having trouble moving that tongue far enough. They can't get it past the lips or being able to put the tongue in the right place to make the different sounds and it can affect their speech. Yeah, we also say babies spend a lot of time crying. So look in their mouth when they're crying and what does that look like? Because sometimes if the child is having trouble latching or isn't the most coordinated eater out of a bottle, there is some sort of motor component that maybe just needs a little bit of strength or some compensation, a different type of nipple or a different type of bottle to make them more successful. Um, and we also progress, help families progress a little faster than I, than they would naturally. We're not giving solid foods when they're not ready, but it's all, I think it's been helpful for parents to kind of get that green light from a professional of saying, it's okay, let them explore that. Um, have a, have a lot of parents and influx in like that um, child-led feeding um, as well. And we, we want to help them kind of identify those signs of like, they don't know what to do with that food. Um, you know, if they're, if they are having trouble swallowing or if they're vomiting a lot, is there something else that we need to look in into such as like an acid reflux or um, something more GI? So kind of following that, helping them follow that progression of those purees to meltables to soft solids to hard solids is a little bit easier for them to grasp versus at three months my child should be doing this and six months my child should be doing this but um feeding has been a little bit of a touchy a harder thing for parents to do on their own I would say has that changed for you because with this baby led weaning I think it I feel like people are doing things differently now than when I finished residency and our progression of purees and, and all that. So how does that change in therapy for you? So if we can roll out that they, all other systems are working normally, there's no GI and there's no oral motor difficulties that we need to work out first. We essentially do child-led feeding here. Mm -hmm. um, in the food categories that they're ready for. And so most of the time, it's just helping to educate the parent on what that next food group should be. Um, and then we're so into messy play and that self-feeding and um, helping them kind of determine like what is a big, big bite versus a small bite? What can't they handle? Um, and we do a lot of education on that gag reflex too. Like that's why they have the gag reflex um, to get a spit out that piece that just seems too big, but they don't know until they try. So I think with families who are at home during mealtimes, um, there has been they're more aware of some of those things that their baby's doing, or they're feeding their baby all the time. The, and the child's not exploring utensils and they're not exploring feeding. So um, that is another thing that we have kind of seen an influx on of being catered to in these, you know, they're just sitting there like eating grapes yeah. from their mom's hands and really not doing it themselves. So um, kind of breaking up some of those bad habits is also our goal with some of our younger feeders. Yeah, I hear that a lot. Here, I'll ask them, are they using a spoon and fork or, you know, drinking from a cup? Well, I don't let them do that because it's very messy. Yeah. Uh, I, and even though it's messy, I get it. And, you know, that, that can be a problem. But at the same time, that's how they build those skills. So let them be messy and, you know, work on that spoon and fork or picking things up with your fingers and kind of smearing it all over the face. That's okay. right after they're done. That's right. We say save bath time for, for after meal time or put something down on the floor. Um, right. you know, it, we definitely try to encourage it as much as possible, even if it's not happening all the time, but just trying to draw them aware of like, if, you know, this doesn't happen now, rigid parents kind of contribute to rigid kids. And so we want to just allow the child the opportunity to explore if they want to. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. And then the last part that we were um, going to talk about is talking some of that communication, social, emotional. Um, 
And I think oftentimes some of our families feel that communication starts when the child starts talking, but really that communication starts from two months you know, a birth on of just making noises and, and following facial expressions. So, so those are some of those early on things that we help parents, encourage parents to do at home. Um, but general rule of thumb is usually one word at one, two word phrases at two, one word directions at one, two step directions at two is kind, is, is kind of where they should fall. Again, it's fluid. Some kids, they're putting words together from the beginning. Other kids are waiting and then they're speaking in sentences, but it's all about that opportunity as well. Communicating with your, with your, with your child and then encouraging some sort of social play, whether it's with siblings or at a daycare or something like that. Um, are you guys finding some of those social emotional concerns coming from parents as well? I know Dr. Austin, you talked about the masks and, and how that is so non-direct, but so important as well. Yeah, we're seeing, um, we're seeing some delays in, in speech um, in the number of words that kids have. Um, I, I couldn't find any like studies that have looked at this specifically. So um, this is observational, it's not an evidence-based. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, like, but communication is so important at the time that we're figuring out, oh, you know, maybe we say mama and dada with um, um, showing, you know, at mama, <laughs> not just babbling. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't really have any other words. So you know, they're about to hit that point where they're going to be very, very frustrated mm -hmm. that they can't communicate what it is they need. And that's, that's kind of when we start looking, at, you know, have we had a lot of ear infections? Do we have fluid in our ears? Is there uh, a medical reason why they're not hearing as well? Mm -hmm. Because if they're not hearing really well, they're not going to speak. They may, mm -hmm. and some of the time, you know, the, the parents are like, oh, but they follow instructions. And I'm like, well, do they know that they need to get their jacket because you're walking to the door? Right. Or are they hearing that? Right. I'm not sure. Yeah. So that's why we, that's why, you know, we, we will, you know, maybe do a, uh, a round of antibiotics or we'll send them to ENT or, um, will um, get an audiometry yeah. and see, are they, are they hearing as well as they could be hearing yeah. um, before? Mm -hmm. Also, while that's happening, I tried to like encourage parents to, to either go online on YouTube or get one of those um, uh, signing baby books to learn a few signs so that the child can communicate better, mm -hmm. like more. Mm -hmm. milk, mm -hmm. um, uh, all done. Yeah. Uh, just so um, they're not quite as frustrated. We have fewer tantrums and fewer of the parents being just exasperated yeah. Um, yeah. while we're trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. And sometimes, it, boom, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Blue goes away and we can hear, and then we start talking and jabbering away. Yeah. Um, Intent to communicate is, is so, like, I think that's the first thing any parent should look for, is their intent to communicate. For, is it eye contact? Is it looking in the direction of someone who's coming into the room? And then that progresses into that babbling and, and, and then pointing to requests. So is that intent there? And if it's not, that's when we're determining, okay, there may be a little bit of a delay here. Let's backtrack and figure out where they're at with their communication. Yeah. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I was just going to add to the hearing thing that you were talking about, because I feel like some parents will say, oh yeah, for sure they can hear, but just being able to hear doesn't mean that you can hear all the frequencies. And so you need to be able to hear the words correctly to be able to reproduce, learn and reproduce those sounds. And so sometimes I will send them to audiology to have the hearing testing done. The other thing that I try to tell parents too is to model good speech. So you wanna speak clearly and not speak in baby talk because if you speak baby talk to the child, then the 
child's gonna learn that baby talk and not learn the correct pronunciation of things. The other thing I recommend is reading to kids every day, even at a young age. Those infants, they are like sponges. They pick up everything. They, they like hearing those books and they like repetition. And I think that also helps contribute to their speech. And as they're getting older, picture books that they can point, you know, where's the dog, where's the cat? And then you can also get the child to say those things are all things that can help foster good speech in young kids. And, and tying this all back into the milestones that we were talking about with gross motor, getting that child as, as they go from their back and belly up into sitting, there's more airflow and, and it's easier to generate some of those, um, the air enough to speak to. So again, giving them the opportunity to sit and play, sit and hold a book, because then we can start maybe getting some of that communication coming as well when they're up versus when they're laying down or, you know, um, isolated. We also love peer play with siblings um, and peer play at daycare. And that's like one of the first things that we help parents decide too, are if we're seeing behaviors or if we're seeing imitation, is it coming from someone at school? And it, it's great if they are imitating daycare, but sometimes we do see a little influx of, you know, pushing or frustration. It's because they can't communicate and that's how they see others communicating their needs too. So helping them kind of navigate that as well. And like, I love the, the sign language and um, encouraging that because some of those tantrums are communicate, you know, communication based. If I can't tell you what I want, so I'm just going to cry or, um, you know, make my needs known somehow. So I, I love that that it's also being encouraged too. And if um, a child is in daycare and around masks all the time, mm -hmm. you know, mom or dad come home and put on like a really, um, contrasting lipstick, make them look at your lips and see the movements. Um, I mean, it sounds silly, but it's something really simple that you can do that could really benefit. Um, and dramatic changes in affect. When you're happy, you're really happy. And when you're upset or sad, you're really upset or sad um, is, is so important to, you know, help with that communication too. It seems silly in the moment, but um, it's, it's very, very helpful for that. Um, so I think overall with milestones, we can agree giving opportunity to these, it's, you know, to your child is the best thing that you can do um, and not getting so tied up in where they need to be month by month, but where they should be in, you know, by this age seems to be helpful to our parents on the therapy side. Is there anything else of helpful hints that you give to your families to just make them not so worried about milestones or um, anything that kind of helps that conversation about when they should be worried other than the topics that we talked about today? I think if your gut tells you something's wrong, something's probably wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to, to listen to that and, um, and get an evaluation, mm -hmm. um, I, I, with my second, uh, my, I, I wasn't seeing my regular pediatrician for one of the visits and I was told I was overreacting and I knew too much. Mm -hmm. And I was just being one of those neurotic pediatricians and, um, the baby's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, that, that put us back about seven months wow. in, as far as getting some therapy. Yeah. Um, and what about, to listen. right. What about, um, comparison to siblings? That's always a gray area for us. Like my oldest did this and now, you know, so it's like that intuition of something is different, but how long do we wait to see if they catch up sort of thing? I think you just have to look at it as they're, they're not the same human being. That's right. They're, they're, they, they carry some genetic material that is the same, but they are not the same. Right. Um, and if they're still within the parameters that, you know, we can look at from the CDC and so forth, um, yeah. you're fine. Yeah. Um, but if you, if, if this keeps you up at night, we're, we're going to get you an evaluation. 
That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And that's how it should be. Yeah. And I just want to give a, um, a plug for the CDC's new, the website is beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and look, look how nice this is. Um, yeah. It's telling you what we expect, what you can do to improve or, you know, keep that going. And if your baby isn't doing these things, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. time to talk to somebody. So, I mean, I think that's just so incredibly helpful and um, empowering for a parent to have mm -hmm. and say, I'm not comfortable with this. This is, let's, let's do something. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because I think the CDC is trying to eliminate that sit and wait mm -hmm. approach that has happened before. And so even though some of our milestones have shifted a little bit, um, there's still milestone, they're still there. So we want to make sure that we're still moving in that direction. Like we talked about with movement and eating, are we facilitating the progression to the, that next step? Whether or not they're not supposed to be there for another three months, that's okay. Are we still encouraging the move, the direction, uh, moving in that direction? Yeah, I like that new CDC checklist. It, I, um, think it's really helpful for parents to know what they should be doing, what things they can work on at home. And I think if you are concerned, you should definitely talk to your pediatrician about it just to um, get the, to find out if there's a problem and get referred early so that you can start therapy and get those issues addressed and things that you can work on at home. And I think that's um, important to start early. And we have so many resources around here as well. Um, mm -hmm in terms of therapy, early intervention, um, you know, they can come to your home and do an evaluation and do therapy there to make it convenient. So I think there's a lot out there for parents. And we, we really do try to accommodate as much as we can um, with flexible hours, increased mm -hmm. staff, offering some virtual visits if we need to, um, just to help accommodate that initial, you know, evaluation. And, and even if they're in early intervention, transitioning now into the clinic, like you said, there's so many resources for outpatient and for early intervention um, mm -hmm. that our families feel well connected. Mm -hmm. You said before, you can do both too. Um, yeah. I, I did that for my daughter as well. We did early, you know, Alliance for Infants, we did private speech therapy and OT and all that in addition to the what was being done through um, Alliance for Infants. And it's, it's such a bonus to have that EI because that's free to you. So if anything, if you're just doing one time a week in the clinic and one time a week at EI, that's twice a week and you're only right. paying for half of it. <laughs> if you're paying yeah. at all, you know, insurance, you might not even be paying for outpatient. So um, our staff and front desk at Positive Steps in any of our offices does such a nice job too of explaining those benefits and mm -hmm us as therapists offering that, you know, you could definitely come here for outpatient, but here's this service that's also offered to you for this amount of time, if that's what, you know, um, you know, what works best for you. Definitely. And I think we have a slide of our information um, for early intervention, positive steps and caring hands. I actually don't have a slide, but this oh. video is going to post onto our Facebook page and all of that information is going to be there in the post for you, Perfect. including that, uh, that great, um, that CDC tracker that you were just talking about. Super. Wonderful. Awesome. All right. I think we hit on a lot of the big topics. Um, hopefully clarified a couple different things in some of those categories and identified some of those, you know, hot topics of, uh, reasons to talk to your pediatrician if, if you know they're not using those checklists, but it sounds like we're trying to close some of those gaps as best as we can um, and help encourage the conversation for sure. Yep. Okay. I think that was a great discussion and I hope that that was helpful for parents uh, to know what to look out for and when to be concerned. definitely reach out if uh, they have questions. Yep. And we always say too, it doesn't hurt if your pediatrician recommends therapy, call us first, 
describe what you're seeing and we can kind of talk you through that process as well. If you're on the fence as a parent about receiving therapy or you don't know what your child should be doing, they can always call us and, and we can kind of talk through that. It's not like you have to come in you know, for, we won't talk to you before the eval. Um, we answer a lot of questions before the evaluation um, with just those intakes. So that's also an option as well. Great, there's a lot of resources out there. So right. <laughs> take advantage of them. <laughs> exactly, awesome. Great, well, thank you guys so much for, for jumping on here today. Um, Dr. Austin, it was great to have you in the conversation as well. Um, any other closing thoughts that you guys have? I think that was a lot of information for parents and I hope they found that helpful, it was great meeting with you again, Alexa, and, um, you know, maybe we'll do it again soon. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, Alexa. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. Have a great day.